I am Barton Reeves, and I am the CEO of Connecticut's Paid Leave Authority, and I want to thank you for being here this evening and for joining us for this, under, this presentation on, on understanding the basics of paid leave. The presentation will take about 25 minutes, and after that time, we will open up the floor for questions. If you have questions, please use the Q&A feature, as this is the best way for us to monitor the questions that you have and to be able to answer them in a way that responds to everyone who is in the Q&A feature. Using the chat feature limits us in the way in which we can answer the questions comprehensively. I have with me today my colleagues, Amber Forrest, who is our Executive Assistant for the Paid Leave Authority, and Aaron Shokat, who is the Authority's General Counsel. Aaron will be answering questions as they arise throughout the presentation, and then, as I mentioned earlier, we'll have an opportunity to answer the questions live. So without a further delay, let me go ahead and share my screen and get started talking about the basics of the paid leave authority. Okay. All right, you're good to go, Andrea. All right, thank you. I just need to do one more thing. I need to stop the video. And I'm not a distraction. And then come on, one more. There we go. And hide the controls. Okay. There we go. All right, off we go. So, just a little bit about me. I, before I came to this role in March of this year, I was the president and CEO at HARC, which supports people with intellectual and related disabilities. And before I went to HARC, I also worked at Lawyers for Children, teaching people how to represent children who were abused and neglected and involved in the uh, DCF system. I have an undergraduate degree from Rutgers and I have a law degree from New York Law School. So today we'll talk about the overview of the paid leave program, some key dates, We'll review the law and applying for paid leave benefits. We'll also review the role of the employer so we can understand how that works and put it in, putting it into practice, which will give us some context. I'll share with you where you can find some additional resources and then we'll have a question and answer session. So a little bit about the Paid Leave Authority. The Paid Leave Authority was brought into existence through a law signed in July of 2019 by Governor Ned Lamont. Our purpose is to serve a growing need by providing financial relief to Connecticut families, which will allow them to care for themselves or loved ones without having to worry about lost income while they do that. We have a two-part mission, and that is to provide pathways to accessible paid family leave benefits. And then we also empower employers, administrators, and healthcare providers by offering them tools and support to navigate the program. We have five primary responsibilities at the Paid Leave Authority. They are outreach and engagement, which includes the opportunity you've given us this evening to speak with you. We develop the policies and procedures that are needed to run the program. We establish the trust fund contribution rate and that fund is used to pay benefits and we receive those contributions. We approve and audit private plans, which are alternatives that private employers can provide instead of opting into the public plan. And finally, we administer claims for paid benefit leaves. Sorry, we, we administer claims for paid leave benefits. Say that the right way. So which employers are covered by this plan? Employers who have one or more employees working in Connecticut, including not-for-profits and private sector employees with a unionized workforce are considered covered employers under the statute. Those who are sole proprietors or self-employed have the option to participate, but if they do so, they have to remain in the plan for a minimum of three years. Those entities to whom the law does not apply and who are not covered include the federal government and the state of Connecticut with an exception for covered public employees. Municipalities and local or regional boards of education are also exempted with the exception of their covered public employees. A total exemption from the law is for non-public elementary or secondary schools. A covered public employee is defined as follows. A non-unionized employee of the state of Connecticut, 
or those unionized employees of the state who collectively bargained to be included in the program. Employees of municipalities and of local and regional boards of education may be included in the program if the unionized employees of either the municipality or the local or regional board of ed collectively bargain to be included. If the collective bargaining is successful in including the union in the program, then all of the employees at the municipality or the local or regional board of education are included in the pay leave program, whether they are in the union or not. You'll note at the bottom that there's a definition of municipality, which is rather extensive. It does include the way in which we traditionally think about municipalities, towns, cities, and boroughs, but it also includes school districts and housing authorities and flood commissions, or an authority established by special act or regional council of governments. So that definition of municipalities is rather extensive. What happens to the money that is collected into the trust fund? So the employees make a contribution of one half of 1% of their wages. The employer is responsible for collecting those contributions and remitting them to the pay leave authority along with wage information that can be verified. We receive that wage information and the contributions from the pay leave authority and we validate that information using data that we get from the Department of Labor and the Department of Revenue Services. Those contributions are then deposited into the Paid Leave Trust Fund, which is managed by the Office of the Treasurer. The Paid Leave Trust Fund funds the benefits that will be paid and made available in 2022. Key dates that you should be aware of are that the website launched ctpayleave.org on September 4th, where an abundance of information can be found for employees, employers, sole proprietors, self-employed, healthcare providers, and third-party administrators. We're asking all employers to register now at ctpayleave.org. That lets us know that you know that your obligation to withhold begins on January 1, 2021, and that benefits will be made available on January 1 of 2022. What are some of the reasons for leave? Leave is available to create or expand your family through the birth of a child or the placement of a child with your family for adoption or foster care. You may also take leave to care for a family member with a serious health condition or your own serious health condition, which can include serving as an organ or bone marrow donor or pregnancy. There is special leave available for military families where a family member who's been injured in the military on active duty can be cared for by another family member. There's also qualifying exigency leave. So if when a family member is called to overseas active duty, they can be seen off to that duty by their family. And what is unique to Connecticut's law is that family violence leave is available for up to 12 days concurrent with our state's family violence leave law. So here is a comparison of our current family and medical leave in the state and what it will look like in 2022. So right now our law applies to employers with 75 or more employees. And those employees have to work for 12 months or at least a thousand hours during the 12 months immediately preceding the time in which they take leave. And when they do so, they're eligible for job protection after the 12 months. They then can take up to 16 weeks of leave in a 24 month period. But to cover that time so that there is some form of wage replacement, an employer can require an employee to take all of their accrued time and exhaust it for leave. And 2022, all of this changes. The law applies to employers of one or more employees. There's no hours worked requirement and job protection is available after three months rather than 12. Leave is available for up to 12 weeks in a 12 month period. Caregiver leave is 26 weeks in a 12 month period with 12 of those weeks paid. An additional two weeks of leave may be available for incapacitation experienced during pregnancy. And an employer will no longer be able to require an employee to exhaust all of their time, but they must allow employees to keep up to two weeks of their accrued vacation or PTO leave. The laws that provide job protected leave, many of which, all of which as a matter of fact will remain in place. The Federal Family and Medical Leave, which applies to employers with 50 people or more. Connecticut's leave remains in place through 2021, and as I noted earlier, will change in 2022. Workers' compensation, 
the Americans with Disabilities Act, the Pregnancy Disability Act, and the Connecticut Fair Employment Practice Act all remain viable laws that offer job protected leave. Income replacement is now available under workers' compensation and the Connecticut Pay Leave Act as of 21, 2022. I note here that if a person is receiving workers' compensation benefits, they are ineligible for benefits from the paid leave authority. The primary difference between the reasons for leave under federal FMLA and the new state law will be the definition of family member, which is much more expansive. Right now under federal FMLA, the reasons for taking leave are limited to caring for a parent, a spouse, or a child who's under 18 or over 18 with a disability. When the law changes for the state law in 2022, an employee can take time off and receive paid leave benefits for all of these categories, a parent, a spouse, a son or a daughter of any age, their siblings, grandparents, grandchild, or a person related to the employee by blood or affinity who has a close relationship that the employee can show is an equivalent of the family relationships noted above. What exactly does related by affinity mean? That first sentence is the definition. A person with whom the employee has a significant personal bond that is like a family relationship regardless of biological or legal relationship. And this by its very nature is situational. But I'll, I will draw your attention to let's say for example, the uh, fourth bullet down. So the child of an employee's former partner who lived with the employee for several years and they maintain a parent-like relationship with the employee or the bullet after that where there is an unmarried significant other of the employee with whom they have a familial spouse-like relationship, even though they don't have a legal relationship to one another. Particularly in those two circumstances, the expansive definition of family allows a person to take leave to take care of people that they consider family and with whom they have a significant personal bond that is like a family relationship. Lengths of leave are outlined here. The federal still has 12 weeks of leave and a 12 month period with the exception of 26 weeks for a military caregiver leave. The same is true for Connecticut FMLA in 2022. And in addition to that, there's 12 days out of the 12 weeks that can be used for family violence leave and an additional two weeks of leave for incapacity due to pregnancy. Those that apply for paid leave benefits have the same types of leave available to them and for the same lengths of time. So what are the eligibility requirements under each of these categories of leave? Federal, as I've noted earlier, has not changed at all. It still requires a 12 month commitment of work and at least 1,250 hours of work immediately preceding the leave. When our law changes in the state the year after next, you have to be employed by the employer for at least three months to get job protected leave and there is no hours worked requirement. In order to access benefits from the paid leave authority, you have to have earned at least $2,325 in the highest earning quarter of the first four of the past five quarters. And that can be earned from one or more employers. And in addition to that, you have to have been currently employed or working in the state, or you were employed and working in the during the, 12, the past 12 weeks immediately preceding your time for applying for benefits, or you're a sole proprietor or a self-employed person who's opted to participate in the program. In addition to this, you have to have a reason for leave that is covered by the statute. What is the role of the employer? Whenever an employee comes to an employer and asks for leave, we want them to ask these two questions to determine whether there is a potentially MLA qualifying reason for job protected status under one or more statutes and to determine whether or not the person is eligible for any kind of income replacement while they are on leave. Both questions must be addressed every time in order to engage in a complete analysis. As noted earlier, an employee can be eligible for federal FMLA only or state or those can run together they may not be eligible for either for a number of reasons, but could be eligible for another kind of protected leave as a reasonable accommodation. For example, the Americans with Disabilities Act or the Pregnancy Disabilities Act, or they may not have any job protected leave at all. 
Is, uh, before we mention this, that we would ask the question whether they're eligible for federal leave or state leave, or whether there's any other kind of job protected leave that they might be covered under. So here are some facts about benefits about income replacement. The benefits coordination can occur, meaning that an employee can receive benefits from the paid leave authority and the employer provided benefits at the same time, but those combined benefits cannot exceed 100% of the employee's regular wages. There are some short-term and long-term disability policies that dictate that state benefits must be used first and then access to the short-term or long-term disability policies might be available. I mentioned this earlier with respect to workers' comp and paid leave, a person who's re re who is receiving workers' compensation benefits is ineligible for paid leave benefits from the paid leave authority. This is an important point. You may be able to access paid leave without job protection. And here's how that might work. The statute says that you're eligible for paid leave benefits if you're taking leave for a reason that's covered under the statute, you've earned $2,325 in that time frame that was outlined in, within those quarters, and you've either, you're either currently working or you have worked for the 12 weeks immediately preceding your time that you're applying for leave. So let's say that you, those criteria were met in another job that you had worked, and now you're in a new job. You've been there for a month. You qualify for paid leave, but because you've only been in the new job for a month, you don't have any job protection. And under those circumstances, it's really important that employers and employees have a really open dialogue about what's going to happen if the person goes to the pay leave authority and gets pay leave, but does not have protection for their job. Employers can also offer a private plan as an alternative to the public plan. And I'll discuss that in a bit. And if they do, then it's the employer's decision around approving paid leave and approving leave in general. So requiring the use of accrued time, as I mentioned earlier, that employers may require employees to use their sick leave, their vacation leave, or other kinds of PTO, but they are entitled to keep up to two weeks of leave. And here's how it works. If you as an employer or you as an employee have sick leave accruals and vacation accruals and personal leave, and they're all in different buckets, your employer could require you to use all your sick leave, but you're, you, are, you are eligible and you are entitled under the statute to keep up to two weeks of your vacation leave. If you use PTO, meaning there's no definition, no separation of the types of leave, then you are entitled to keep up to two weeks of your PTO. If you have unlimited PTO, and I know some workplaces do, that might not be applicable here, then that employer has to make a determination as to how they will administer this benefit, knowing that a person has to keep up to two weeks of their leave. So how does the person apply for benefits at the paid leave authority? First, what they do is the employee submits an application to their employer for leave and they get their leave approved. Then the employer will grant that leave and let that employee that they have, that they have granted their leave, and then they let them know if they have any PTO, vacation, sick time, anything else, short, long-term disability that could cover and provide income replacement while the person is out. If after that discussion, there's a determination that more paid time will be needed, or I should say more paid leave benefits will be needed to cover the time away, then the employee themselves applies to the paid leave authority for those benefits. When they do so, we at the authority determine their eligibility based on their earnings and all the criteria mentioned earlier, including the reason why they're seeking benefits, which has to be covered by the statute. We calculate the amount of the benefit. We go back to the employer so we can make sure that those covered absences are validated and to see whether there is any other time or benefit that's available to the employee to offset their, their pay, to calculate the offset of the paid time off and the benefit. Once we've done that, then we issue benefits payments. And exactly how much is that? So here's the formula for paid leave benefits as it appears in the statute. So let's work on the left side where we where the person's base weekly earnings are less than or equal to the minimum wage multiplied by 40. 
employees that fit in this category will get 95% of that employee, that covered employee's base weekly earnings. We know that the minimum wage now is $12 an hour. So that means that 40 times 12 is 480. So the maximum benefit you could get is 95% of that, which is $456. If your base weekly earnings on the right side exceed more than the Connecticut minimum wage multiplied by 40, then there's two parts to your formula. You get that 480, then 60% of the amount of the base weekly earnings that exceed that amount multiplied by 40. It sounds convoluted, but I have an example on the next page. All right, so here's Mike on the left side. He makes $375 a week, which is less than the 480. So when we take 95% of his 375, he will get $356.25 a week in pay leave benefits. Deborah makes considerably more money. So we take the first part of the formula, which is the 40, which is the Connecticut minimum wage multiplied by 40, which gives us $480. Then she gets 60% of the amount of her base weekly earnings that exceed that 480. So we take her $700 a week, we subtract the 480, and that gives us $220. Then we take 60% of the $220, we add those together, and those are her base weekly earnings and benefits that she will receive. So now let's look at Connecticut pay leave in the workplace. Exactly how does that work? So we know how, employer, employees will, um, how employers will approve it. We know how employees will come and apply, and we know essentially how much they're going to get when they do. How does it work in the workplace? And this is how it works. So we have our friend, Mr. Coyote, who's worked at his place of employment for 10 years, and it's a large employer with 100 employees. He has four weeks of sick leave and two weeks of vacation time. He hurts his hand in a non-work-related fireworks injury because we know those that, that uh, we know workers' comp injuries are ineligible for collection. So is he entitled to job protection? And is he entitled or eligible for job replacement benefits? And here's how it works. He's worked for 10 years. So we know that he has protection under the Connecticut FMLA because he's worked far longer than three months and under federal for the same reason because he's worked for 10 years. He has four weeks of sick leave. So his employer has said to him, you must exhaust your sick leave benefits first. And he's done that through the month of February, but he's going to be on another four weeks. And that's when he'll come to the pay leave authority and get wage replacement benefits from us. What about a part-time employee or someone who has less tenure? So here's Jamie and she works part-time and she's worked for Bionics RS for two years. She has far less time than Mr. Coyote did. She has six weeks of six, six days of sick leave and three weeks of vacation time. And she breaks her legs running, her breaks her leg running with her dog. She asks the same question, job protection leave, income replacement eligibility. So Jamie is different here. She is eligible for Connecticut FMLA. She's been there longer than three months and for paid leave benefits, but she is not eligible for federal FMLA because she's not worked enough hours, even though she's been with the employer for more than a year. She then has to use all of her sick leave accruals and a, and a week of her vacation time, because remember she's allowed to keep two weeks and the rest of her wage replacement would come from the paid leave authority. For spouses who work for the same employer under federal and state leave, under federal leave, the spouses are required to share their 12-week job protected leave entitlement if it's for bonding with a child that is new to their family through birth, adoption, or foster care, or to care for a parent with a serious health condition. Under the state leave, similarly, the, the sharing of the job protected leave occurs to bond with a new child or to care for a family member with a serious health condition. But under the Connecticut pay leave law, the spouses are not required to share their 12 week pay leave benefit for any reason. You heard me talk a bit about private plans. The statute does allow employers as an alternative to offer a private plan, but it must meet these criteria. It has to be the same or better in the benefits it offers as the public plan. And it cannot cost employees any more than the public plan does. And that is limited to one half of 1% of contribution. 
If the public plan lowers its rate, the private plan must follow suit. It has to demonstrate the ability to administer the claims and benefits and by statute, it has to hold a vote to seek the employee's approval of the private plan option. And that has to be a vote of the majority of all of the eligible employees who work in Connecticut. And finally, the paid leave authority has to approve the plan. For employers who are interested in this, they'll come to our website, they'll let us know now whether or not they intend to uh, apply for a private plan. Soon they'll be able to go back and provide us more details through an application. And then they'll be able to upload some final plan documents that would be the basis upon which we will issue our approval. If we issue approvals for private plans, they are good for three years, but they are subject to periodic review to make sure that they have not changed substantially since the time that employees voted on them. Here are some additional resources that might be available to you because I've talked about a lot of things today. On our website at ctpaylee.org, you will find a lot of information. There is an employee rights poster that outlines everything that I spoke of today and a rack card, which is actually a smaller version of the poster. There is an employer toolkit that's actually available to everyone. We just named it employer toolkit that summarizes in a 24 page document, everything that I spoke of today, private plans, eligibility, all of that. Uh, the, one of the most frequently downloaded documents that we have is this paycheck mailer that is available for employers and employees and everyone else to use to uh, just have notice that paychecks will be changing in January of 2021. And then there is an employee fact sheet that's also available on the website. So for those of you who are employers, we're asking for some immediate action to occur. That is that employers should be going to the website and registering uh, as of December 31st, 2020. If you use a payroll provider, please make sure you let them know that they should know already. Educate everyone about the withholding and then visit our site regularly for updates. And we're here to help you. Please use the contact us feature on our website and please look at the frequently asked questions and the helpful videos. I thank you for your time this evening. Okay. So we can see if Amber, we can see if there are any questions at all. Sorry, Erin. See, Erin is there. Hi, Andrea. So there Hi. were a few questions that came through during the presentation, which okay. um, I did answer, but let me share. Let's go through the questions that came through in case other people are interested in them. Um, one question was, will we share the slide deck? And I said, yes, that, that is something that we can share. Yes. So that, that can happen. Um, this was a, a first question, the first time that I've seen it, which was an actual timely question, which was, will the tribal enterprises be required to remit paid leave deductions? That is a great question. Um, and as, as we sit here today, the, the answer is we're not sure, but we are having discussions with the tribal enterprises and we'll have a more definitive answer probably in another week or so. Would you say that's probably fair, Erin? Yeah, I had, I had alluded to the fact that as sovereign nations, they really do have, um, they're not subject to state law, but we're exploring whether there's a way for them to opt in. Absolutely, that's correct. Um, there were two questions that related to um, kind of the, the collective bargaining elements. One mm. was, what is the process if a union, uh, a municipal union, for example, wanted to participate? Um, and they also wanted to know if they'd have to wait, if they opted in, would they have to wait? And I had said, our law doesn't really address that process as really subject to collective bargaining. That's um, correct. Yeah, but if they, mm -hmm. but if they did negotiate to have participation, they would be in. There's no official waiting period. No, there is no official waiting period, and that, as I mentioned earlier in the video, I'm sorry, in the presentation, that that vote is binding not just on the bargaining unit, but of all of the employees in the municipality. So, and then the other question that came through relating to collective bargaining was, um, could the a private sector union bargain how much sick leave they'd have to use before they could apply to the Connecticut paid leave law. And I said, again, our, our statute really isn't, um, doesn't address that. And I, I, I said the Connecticut FMLA 
says the employer may permit or require an employee to use earned accruals, but whether that's an appropriate topic for bargaining is something that they would want to consult their labor attorneys about. Yes, I think that's, that's correct. And then the last question, we got, um, I think just a little bit more about the way the employer provided benefits intersect with our benefits. This particular question was, if you have short-term disability, can mm -hmm. you collect from both at the same time? And I didn't know how I, you wanted to answer that. And yes, yes, you can, as long as the collection of the short-term disability and the paid leave benefits don't exceed 100% of wages. That's why when you come and you apply to the paid leave authority for benefits, we will be having a discussion with the employer to see what benefits you have available, any other accrued time, so that we can have that benefits coordination. Because the idea is that for the paid leave program to work as it should, it's supposed to offer some degree of wage replacement so that you're not without any income during the time that you're away. But we want to make sure that the fund is solvent, okay, that's one of the criteria, and that uh, there's adequate wage replacement, but not an, an excessive wage replacement by getting more than 100%. And we just got a new question in um, mm. from Monica. Hi, Monica, it's nice to hear from you. For state employees that are currently included in this program, which means the non-union non employees, right. what are the parameters for using sick time before applying for PFML? And if you have enough earned accruals that go beyond 12 weeks, does that mean you can't um, apply for benefits from PFML? Oh, so Erin, you're probably better able to answer this question than, than I am, but I your eligibility for um, PFML is one that can be determined when you apply. So I would say, Erin, could you repeat the last part of the question for me, just to make sure I can understand it? Right. If the employee has enough earned accruals to cover the 12 weeks, does that mm. mean that you would not apply for benefits from the paid leave authority? No, that doesn't mean it at all. So you, again, looking at the benefit coordination and also looking at, at how many weeks you have available to you, you, and I don't know what position, quite frankly, the state is going to take with respect to the exhaustion of the leave before a, a, we can access our, our own benefits as I'm a state employee as well. So that really is unclear at this point. But right now, what I would say to state employees is that you should, if you're contributing to the plan, you should apply for your paid leave benefits. We will work with the state, especially um, the Office of the Controller and DAS to figure out what that coordination will look like and not assume that you have to use up all of your accruals and not have any access to benefits. Yeah, I would add to that, that right now the policy in the state is you have to use your sick leave accruals for your own serious health condition, but you're not mm -hmm. required to use sick leave for a caregiver or bonding or military situations. So um, there certainly are opportunities to access Connecticut paid leave. I'll also point out that when we last mm -hmm. did a, a search, um, almost 50% of state managers did not have enough sick time on the books to cover mm -hmm. uh, um, the 12 weeks. So this is still a benefit that managerial employees would utilize. Okay. Uh, so we have a question that asks, what if the one half of 1% is not enough to keep the fund liquid? What will we do? All right, so what will we do? Well. The statute itself has a provision built into it that we can adjust downward the amount of benefits that are paid so that we can, in fact, keep the fund liquid. So that's the first part. The second part is that we did have a new actuarial analysis done of the fund to see what liquidity and solvency would look like if our current situation persisted for some period of time, if the economy gets better, which we all hope that it will. And even under the worst case scenario, the fund remains liquid with people receiving benefits at the rate that are within, that's within the statute. So those are actually the, the two means by which we know as we sit here today that the fund will remain solvent. We also have a question that says, um, can we use this along with Colonial or AFLAC or other short-term disability that we pay into? Are we able to keep both? Um, I'm not entirely clear if they mean employer provided short term or if they mean truly an employee on their own goes out and gets short term disability. So maybe Jean, if you wanted to 
Oh, Jean is saying, yes, we pay personally for this short-term yes. disability. So you're, yes, we don't offset based on any policy that you've purchased yourself outside of your employment. That's your money, you pay for that policy. And, and this is very common with the other states that, we, that we've spoken to as well. So that's not taken into consideration because that's why you purchased it so that you can, you can have that guaranteed income or coverage of unexpected expenses. Our coordination of benefits is really with those employer provided benefits. So there, there wouldn't be any impact uh, on your benefits based on your personal policy that you're receiving. And then we have another question that asks, what, what is the basis or how do we determine our base salary? And they said with RNs and other medical professionals, um, their base salary is often a lot lower than their take home. I think that this really gets to the question of, is overtime counted when we yes. determine what your salary is? Yes. So um, the way that the statute reads is that you're, it would include overtime for your base weekly earnings. There is a very, uh, it's a complicated definition, first of all, what wages are and what base weekly earnings are in the section. And I won't bore you by reading it, but yes, you can assume that, that it would include those wages. Great. And then we just had a, um, a request for clarification about the Colonial and AFLAC, um, where they're saying they're state-sponsored short-term disability, which okay. is different than state-paid, right? So the fact I that see. the state lets you come in let the AFLAC come in and sell these policies to us does not mean the state's paying it, paying for it. Um, that's so I correct. think that's the difference. That, that is the difference. So if, um, you know, if AFLAC has the opportunity to leverage access to uh, state employees, that's still something that you pay for out of pocket. So it's still your policy that's different from the state either contributing in whole or in part to the policy itself. That would be a whole different story. So you're right, Aaron. Yeah, I know um, I know a lot of employers in the private sector do offer short-term disability as a employer-provided benefit. Yes. The state does not happen to do that. Correct. But um, we let people come in. So there are no current questions. I don't know if anyone else wants to add any questions to the Q&A while you have us here. Okay. While we're waiting, Andrea, did you want to mention the other webinars that we offer if people have any questions? Yeah, so Amber is going to drop um, some links in the chat if she hasn't done so already for other webinars that we will be offering through the end of the year. And then we'll be taking a little break and then getting ourselves geared up for the following year. There are webinars on how to register. There's webinars on the um, private plan. And there's webinars on the legal implications of paid leave. And again, there's all, those are all primarily uh, employer focused, but we do run the understanding the paid leave webinar, just the basics, the one that I talked this evening regularly. We'll continue to offer those through the beginning and through the first quarter of next year. And then our attention will turn considerably to making sure that people understand the benefits that are available for paid leave, how benefits are calculated, and then as the year goes on, we'll be able to offer, offer uh, some explanation on how to apply for those benefits as well. I, oh, Erin, I think I see one question that's come in. Yeah, we got a couple. So oh, okay. the first one is, how would we know if our employer has enrolled? All right. So you will know that your employer has enrolled because you should be seeing the deduction of the one half of 1% from your pay. If you have a question about whether your employer has enrolled, you should go to the contact us feature of the website and we can tell you whether or not your employer has enrolled. But Erin, it's funny because this question also came up um, at a couple of webinars earlier. And so it, it might be worth it for us to figure out a way to put a list of those enrolled employers um, more proactively on the site. So we can think about doing that as well. Right, I can tell you that to our knowledge, no state union has collectively bargained to participate and we are not aware of any municipal or public, um, local or regional board of education that has negotiated to participate. So if you are a public sector unionized employee, I think you can assume for now that you're not in the program and that you'll find out if you are. Okay. Um, if you are a private sector employee, you should assume that you are covered because the private sector employers cannot opt out. The only thing they can do is offer a private plan 
And before they can offer a private plan, they have to put that to a vote of all employees. So, and then the follow-up question is, what if we haven't received any information from our employer? Um, this person saying, you know, we have, we work for a hospital and our employer mm -hmm. hasn't told us about this program yet. Oh my goodness, okay. Well, we'll continue to try to reach out to employers. We've done over 60 webinars and uh, we and all of the major payroll providers in the state, meaning the sort of the ADPs and the paychecks of the world, they also know and they they will they were responsible for downloading that paycheck mailer and making sure that it was included in every paycheck and pay stub that went out. Uh, and most people access those electronically. So we will we will check again to make sure that all of the large employers know we're doing our best to reach out to them. But thank you for letting us know that because we'll reach out again. And then we have another question, which says, um, they say, well, as you know, workers comp usually only pays about 70 to 75% of base salary. So does, does that mean that P Connecticut PFML will not cover the additional 20% or so that would bring them up? Um, and the answer is the statute excludes people who are receiving workers comp. So it's not a question of the 100% in that situation. It's just That's that. Correct. Uh, yes. The statute specifically excludes those who are receiving workers' comp from receiving any benefits from the Paley Authority while they're receiving workers' comp benefits. Right. So a new question. If paid leave is based on earned weekly wage, will paid leave take effect, especially if the employee... not entirely sure I understand it. If paid leave is based on earned weekly wage, will paid leave take effect, especially if the employer lim limits the amount of weekly sick time taken. For example, you're scheduled 32 hours and you work 40 plus hours. So I'll have to honestly say I'm not sure I understand the question. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, um, and I would like to answer it. So let me just take a look yeah. here. And do you know who, who posed it? Patricia posed it. So I don't know if you if you want to reframe I can. it. Patricia. Well I can I can allow Patricia to talk so that she can actually tell me. Will we can make up the difference. All right. Huh. So, oh. Patricia, you should be able to answer the question directly now. If you want to take yourself off of mute. Or not. Okay. So hi, hi. Oh, Hi. Okay. Sorry, it took me a minute. It's so, all right. Thank you for taking my question. So typically the hospital will limit the amount of sick time you take if you're on leave. So in the case where some people work a lot of hours, mm -hmm. um, will that paid leave recognize the fact that you're only taking 32 hours and you typically take 40 plus hours home and pay? Oh, I see. Okay. Interesting question. It really is. And I'm not sure we have the answer to that. So just applying, we're going to have to, we're going to have to work with the hospitals on that because just applying standard FMLA rules, um, you, if you, your work week is dependent upon your average hours worked, not, not necessarily 32 hours. You know, if you average 40 hours because you always do at least some overtime, that's what your work week is considered. Um, and we would be looking at your average wage based on your highest earned quarters, the two highest earning quarters you have in the first four. So I, th I think the answer is that there would be a way to make up for it because we're, we're trying to get you to your average earnings and then we'd right. only offset the sick leave that you're taking. But um, that's a really good question and we're gonna have to work with the hospitals to try and understand kind of their rules but the goal is to make sure that you get you get to to your coverage um, so I think that there's a way to resolve it okay thank you thank you Patricia okay All always right. interesting to hear how different industries set absolutely up. absolutely and I think we're going to have to have some more conversation with the hospitals. So is there anyone else who has any questions for us this evening? Okay. 
It doesn't look like it. I think we're no. last Could call for questions. Oh, it's oh, one. <laughs> oh, it's a thank you. Thank you for oh, okay. letting us come. Thank you. We're happy to give 15 minutes back thing for your evening. Please stay in and stay safe, especially with this huge storm that's coming our way. And we wish you all the best for the holiday season and have a great evening. Thank you.